Huzzah, Rangers! This is your boy Phil Harris here at the Jacks Rangers Show. And we are joined with a very, very special guest this time around. His name is Nate Brakely. He is the new Independence Head Coach for our New England Free Jacks. Nate, how the hell are you? I'm doing great. Excited to do this. Excited to get, get stuck in here. Awesome. This episode of TJRS is sponsored by the Rowdy Rangers Club on Patreon. Head over to patreon.com and search for, search for Rowdy Rangers Club to sign up for exclusive TJRS content today. There's over 45 posts in there already. We were like two, two weeks old with the Patreon, so really, really excited with um, how well this thing has started out. Let's talk about uh, something real quick here in terms of where are you from? I think a lot of people out there know your uh, your uh, origins and your roots, but let's go over that for those who don't. Uh, yeah, so from uh, Massachusetts originally, uh, I was in North Andover until eighth grade uh, and then in uh, Marblehead uh, until finally flying the coop. Uh, I spent the last 10 years in New York City uh, wow. after college um, mm -hmm. and then I've moved back and I'm now in Charlestown. I've been in Charlestown for a year now. Nice. And you're a Dartmouth guy. You spent uh, four years there at Dartmouth being coached by Mags, who is the CEO of the New England Free Jacks, co-founder, co-owner, that whole thing. What is your origin story with rugby, though? How did you get started with rugby? Yeah, so I went to uh, St. John's Prep in Danvers, Massachusetts here um, and uh, obviously had no rugby experience going into that. Um, mm -hmm. Played baseball my whole life growing up, um, went out for the baseball team, uh, got cut and needed something to do in the spring. Um, and rugby, it was either run track or do rugby. Um, and anybody who's ever seen me run uh, knows that <laughs> that was an easy decision. Sure. Um, and so picked it up and, uh, yeah, I kind of fell in love with it. Um, if you'd asked me uh, at any point before probably my junior year of high school, I would have told you I was going to play football my whole life. Um, yeah. And then... Rugby uh, became my true passion there and followed that for quite a while. Incredible. A lot of the Rangers out there, the hardcore Free Jacks fans, thought at some point for sure you'd be playing for the New England Free Jacks because of that Dartmouth connection with Mags and you being a Mass native and all that sort of stuff. I think no one predicted that your involvement with the New England Free Jacks was going to be in a co coaching role, but I know a lot of the excitement is out there regarding this announcement and how often do you get to speak to Mags and did he ever try to recruit you to become a New England Free Jack? Uh, yeah, I, I speak to Mags uh, fairly regularly. Um, yeah, you know, the, the connection was always there um, and I was always, I think if, if the rest of life had worked out, I would have been very keen to come up here and play. Um, sure. I, uh, I was working a, a full-time job the whole time through my rugby career, which was based in New York City. Wow. Um, and so that was a huge piece as well. And then there's, you know, once the rivalry is established a bit and I've got a couple of years under my belt at New York, I, it's hard to jump ship. Even if, uh, even if here is home, hard to jump ship and come to the other side. Sure. Uh, once, once I was established there as well. So I think, um, maybe if, if New England had joined the league at the same time as New York and I hadn't kind of established myself in New York, Mm -hmm. uh, there would have been a better chance, but they, we definitely had some conversations. It just ne never was never was right. So, uh, very pleased to to finally get the get the option. And probably the one silver lining to uh, New York folding, you know, despite breaking my heart, uh, is that there's there's the club's no longer there for me to feel uh, any twinge of guilt about joining the Free Jacks. <laughs> That's true. Rest in peace, New York, for sure. And obviously, it would have been a bit awkward for you to go from New York Iron Workers to the Free Jacks, but I know a lot of people were, were rooting for that, especially on X uh, slash Twitter, for sure. But what's your favorite memory of Mags, and what was it like being coached by him? Because a lot of people you know, nowadays see him as like this fun-loving CEO type, but what was he like as a coach? Um, yeah, so I mean, I guess, I guess to begin on the actual serious note is Mags as a coach is very good at um, kind of broadening your mind to the possibilities of what, uh, what was possible on a rugby field. And I think a lot of coaches are kind of have their understanding of rugby and say like, this is how rugby is played. Here's how you do. Here's what a lineup looks like. Here's what a pass looks like. Here's what a scrum looks like. Sure. Um, and I think Mags is very good at saying like, here's 10 different ways that a lineup could look. Uh, here's how you might decide which is the best one for you for this situation for this game plan. And okay. I think that that helped me early on because, you know, I came from high school where I was just learning the game, just learning the skills um, and had a very narrow understanding of the sport. Um, and I think at Dartmouth really 
um, gave me a, a broader appreciation of, of uh, what I didn't know, but also how to learn what I didn't know. Uh, and I think Mag is a very good uh, coach at teaching you how to learn. Um, and then on the uh, you know favorite memories is for all his uh, you know cerebral thoughts about the nature of rugby. He's also as you as everyone knows, he's a very silly guy. Um, yes, so, he is. Yeah. Um, you know, under all of that is just lots of shenanigans. Um, and so we had a lot of fun while we were doing all that. I bet so, man. I really enjoy Mags. Like I was one of the first people to buy merch and buy a season ticket. So he sent me a little a personalized note that I still have to this day. And, you know, every time I see him, he's like, hey, Phil, what's up? So like, you know, he shows appreciation to this show and to the fans. Like I don't think any other, I mean, I'm sure the, the other leadership within MLR is fantastic, but Mags has a very, very special connection with the fans. And I, I'll always remember Mags at the very beginning of this whole experiment down there at uh, Weymouth at Fort Union Point, as we called it, was putting together stuff by himself, like putting together the stands. He made a, um, a scoreboard, a temporary scoreboard in his uh, his barn. So, like, I'll always remember that side of him as just an amazing, you know, uh, do-it-all attitude. And he's, he's just a really fun and goofy guy, which I appreciate tremendously. Uh, speaking of fun, of fun and goofy, uh, Halloween was just a couple of nights ago. It's my favorite holiday. Um, what is your favorite Halloween costume ever that you've worn? Oh, ever. Um, great question. Um, <laughs> I had, when I was a kid, um, I had a Robin Hood costume that I quite liked. Um, oh, it was, right. it was uh, the, you know, the Robin Hood costume from Disney's Robin Hood. And so I was, there were no Fox features, but it was the same, you know, green triangle hat and basically knock off Peter Pan outfit um, that my mom <laughs> okay. made me that I was very, that I was very pleased with. Um, and I got a, had a, you know, a bow made from a stick and some twine. Um, so I was a uh, proper Robin Hood. And so I think that would probably be my favorite. That's a good one right there for sure. I love the Robin Hood movie back in the day with Disney. Uh, great story. And uh, yeah, I would have loved to have seen that one. Uh, maybe you'll have to post it on social media after this conversation here. Uh, best Halloween candy. What is that? Oh, yeah. I'm going to I'm gonna probably make some people angry here. Uh, Almond Joy. Okay. I don't hate it. I, it's not one of my favorites for sure, but I don't dislike it. Some people really like get grossed out when you mention Almond Joys That's and I don't quite understand it. it. You, you get real good odds on trading for that, right? You get 100%. two Almond Joys for a Snickers and I'll take that all day. I love that. Yeah. I'm a, I'm more of a Reese cup kind of guy, but I also yeah. love a Snickers, yeah. but I don't dislike the Almond Joys like some people do. Buy or sell, Nate, candy corn. You buying or selling Ooh. that? Uh, well, you know, it tastes like uh, styrofoam nostalgia. And so depending <laughs> on whether you're, uh, you know, more keen on the nostalgia or less keen on the styrofoam, that's where you're going to land. I'll take I'll take candy corn any day, but I, I understand the uh, the aversion. Sure. It kind of tastes like wax. It's not really uh, one of my favorites for sure. But on Halloween, you might as well get involved in the festivities. And part of that is eating candy corn. I wouldn't have it any other day. Uh, I would say that. But, you know, on, candy, uh, on Halloween, sure. Why not? Buy or sell giving out anything but candy on Halloween, like toothbrushes, random stuff, people giving out hot dogs. Like what what's your thoughts on giving anything except for candy on Halloween? Uh I've not heard of hot dogs. I think anything that you anytime you're giving out something because you feel you know better, you can shove that. Like <laughs> this holiday is not about your soapbox, it's right. about kids and candy. But if you're giving out hot dogs on your grill in a driveway. I kind of back that. I think that's pretty That's kind of cool. Yeah, but you're opening yourself up to get your house egged, right? Especially if it's something bad like toothpaste or toothbrushes. That is so lame. Um, okay, back to rugby. How did this appointment come about for you being the independence coach? And what is your coaching background? Yeah, great question. <laughs> Probably one's going to answer the other. Yeah. Um, is uh, Yeah, you know, I was definitely keen to get involved. Uh, TK reached out early when I was moving back, um, but also retired and basically said, like, you you let me know when, when you want to get involved. We'll figure out what that looks like. Um, and so I yeah, retired and moved here a year ago um, and kind of felt ready to uh, start things back up next year. Um, and, uh, they said, great, you're going to coach the independents. I said, huh, okay, <laughs> let's go. Um, and so as far as my, uh, my coaching background, 
uh, you know, in an official capacity as none. Um, I've done a, uh, done some sessions with Dartmouth um, just because I still have that connection there. Um, yeah. And I've done, you know, plenty of peer coaching, we'll call it, where I've played long enough and I've played with enough levels that, you know, I have a pretty good sense of how to coach individual folks. Um, mm -hmm. But as far as coaching a whole team, yeah, basically no experience. So we'll be uh, we'll be learning together. Love that. You know, I was down there uh, in Belfast for the independence trip over there. The first very historic, obviously, being the, the first competition played outside of the United States for any, any MLR club, to my knowledge. Um, and it was an awesome experience for myself and those guys that got to play against the Ulster Academy. Now, it was a bit of a butt whooping. Um, so, you know, we'll have to keep that in mind going forward with that whole program. I've got some more questions about that uh, coming up here. Ranger Horkin, or Rowdy Ranger Horkin, because since he's a member of the Patreon now, sent over a couple of questions for you, Nate. He's also a St. John's prep guy. So, um, but he, he he's at Dartmouth now. So, oh, excuse me, he's at Brown, which is a rival of Dartmouth. So not. Oh, uh, yeah, so he can ignore this question. <laughs> All right, he's got some good ones. So let's go through them here. Do you have an intent to train with or even look to play for the Free Jacks or is it strictly a coaching role? Now, let me set this up real quick here. Let's say the Free Jacks are having an injury crisis at the lock position and TK comes to you and says, please, Nate, we need your help. What's his, what's the answer he's going to get? Uh, he's going to get uh, redirected to my agent, a.k.a. my wife, um, and she will <laughs> let him know the appropriate price tag on my knees, back, and brain. All right. There we go. Okay. I think that's the answer that we were uh, we were expecting to get here. Um, let's see here. If, a, if, a, if there is a certain goal for a number of under 23s to make it to the senior training squad after graduation age out, so is there a certain number of players that need to kind of be – moved up uh is or is it just like whoever's talented enough to make the the, the team yeah you know it, it, it's gonna obviously we'd, we'd love every anybody that goes into an mlr academy to have the opportunity to play on the senior side mm -hmm. um there's so many variables that go into that is if the free jacks have the four best second rows in the league uh, and we have a stud second row in the academy, there's just no space for him to go up. And so he may right. be the best player on the academy team and he's still not going to get a crack and, but vice versa, they may have an injury crisis somewhere and somebody who's not ready gets thrown in. Right. And so I think speaking in terms of numbers there is probably missing the point of this. That is to develop uh, these young men into fellows that are capable of playing MLR and also probably to help them make the decision, which I think is still a really hard one for kids coming out of college. It's mm -hmm. still the concept of professional rugby is still so young that a lot of them don't right. know what it looks like and whether it's something they're interested in. Um, so I think if we can expose them to, to a professional environment or a pre-professional environment, um, that will help those young men build the skills necessary, hopefully to play at the next level or at least enter into the next level. Um, and then also make decisions for themselves. And for some of those boys, that may mean they move back home to San Diego and play for mm -hmm. the Legion, which is great. That's a success for us. Um, it right. may mean they stick around here, or it may mean they realize that cracking into each other on a cold, uh, rainy New England night is not their thing, and they want to go get a job, um, which is great as well. Yeah. But hopefully we're um, overall that we are building the game of rugby and raising the standard across the region, uh, mm -hmm. which will pay dividends for the Free Jacks. I love that you mentioned that a success for you guys is even if a player gets an opportunity on another MLR team, right? That's a success for the Free Jacks Academy system. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, them playing for the Free Jacks. It could be any MLR team that happens to pick up a young guy that was trained by the uh, the academy here in New England. Now, maybe eventually we'll get to a point where there's compensation involved if another team wants to get one of these guys out from under the, the Free Jacks Academy. That could be many, many years away. But um, to have that, you know, all, as a background for this this uh, academy would be huge. Obviously, Junior Gaffa is a guy that played with the Independents, was selected by the Free Jacks and has now made his way down to Charlotte and really, really impressed 
for those guys to get more playing time and a better opportunity down there for USA Rugby. So that's another success story as well that people are saying, oh, what a huge loss. That guy has so much potential. But ultimately, you know, he was he grew up. I mean, he became a rugby player in the background of the Free Jacks right around the corner here in at Brown. Um, and played with the independents as well and was selected by the Free Jacks, so it's still a success story as well. Uh, let's see what else here. Uh, how do you plan to manage the under-23s training plan, given how little time you have with the players and that they're coming from many different universities with different systems and strategies? That's a, that's a really, really good question from uh, Ranger Hork in there. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. Um, and – Anybody that has played on a select side before can tell you that it's never perfect. Um, the good news is that this is a select group of young men. Uh, they're U23, meaning at the very least, they certainly they probably all have four years of college rugby experience, which means they know how to play rugby. They know mm -hmm. the basic ideas. Uh, in this day and age, they probably all play a one three three one pattern. Um, they've all run a five man line out. They've all run a six and a seven man line out. Yeah. So what it is then is deciding um, as a coaching staff, what do we want to prioritize? Um, what type of rugby do we want to play? And what are the essentials and non-negotiables that we put in place to make that happen? Are we going to make every one of these players a stud in, you know, six training sessions before we go to uh, we're going to Scotland this year? Um, hopefully that's not secret. Um, uh, okay. Awesome. Um, uh, there, yeah. So I'm about to cut that out. I'm about to check with uh, TK on that. Um, be fine. but like, what is, um, you know, we aren't, we aren't going to make all of them stud players. We aren't, aren't going to dramatically change the way they play the sport. What we're going to do is give them pointers and direction on how we want to play and how we think they can improve individually. Mm -hmm. Um, from there, hopefully we have a base that we can grow from and put in place that common language. And so over the season of, uh, you know, six games, wherever we end up playing, uh, that we see market improvement, that we see these players um, understand how they can and how they need to improve. Um, and we'll go from there. Awesome. Love the answer for sure. And it's one of those things like, you know. That's that's something that always people always talk about is with these select squads, these all-star squads, if you will, that are coming out of this scenario where they're in college, they're playing under that system. How much time is going to be available, and what you know, all that sort of stuff. And ultimately, what matters is getting game time for these kids that is outside of what they're normally doing in season with their college. And you know, the Belfast trip was a huge eye opener for those young men playing against some of the best talent in all of Ireland that have been playing rugby since they could walk. Right. So you know, we've got to get there at some point. Um, how does New England develop the best under 23s team in MLR? Do you have a plan for that long-term, short-term? <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I think, again, it, it comes down to, like, what you're working with, right? Is that um, if uh, Charlotte picks their U23 team from uh, – of 23 players from life or, say, there's a uh, L.A. team or a um, San Diego team that's all Cal, right? Or mm -hmm. pick, pick your rugby powerhouse. Sure. The talent pool they pull from is probably going to be better than our Ivy League and Nerfu talent pool. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we say the best academy team is that that in a head to head match, they're going to win. Uh, again, it's probably not the right measure. It's how do we take the talent pool that is available to us um, and put uh, the tools in front of them and also put them into a process by which we can identify that outsized talent. Um, and we can develop and foster that outsized talent um, because, again, we are not trying to uh, build a 23 for the Free Jacks. We're trying to identify the, the talent and build the talent um, in those individuals and in the community. And so it's kind of a rising tide situation where we, we're hoping for we're hoping for a few studs. Um, we know that we aren't going to get 23 studs. Right. I think that's something that people will have to come around to the idea of that because everybody's like, well, the free jacks are in the MLR are the best team out there. So, you know, the idea of the independence, not, you know, that's not the goal of the independence to create the best under 23 squad. It's putting guys in positions to be successful within the free jacks or just overall the league itself. Yeah. So, um, so, so again, to, to, 
kind of restate that. It is absolutely to develop the best academy, but the measure of the best academy is not who wins head to head. Gotcha. Yep. What message do you have for all the Rangers out there, the hardcore Free Jacks fans, now that you're coming on as the independence head coach? Um, I would just say how excited I am to be part of a community like this. The fact that there is a Free Jacks Patreon that people pay for for <laughs> access to Free Jacks content um, is miles ahead of anything I've heard for MLR. Uh, yeah. And that type of enthusiasm cannot be manufactured. Um, and it's really cool uh, to be a part of a, uh, a community and a fan base and a team that fosters that. Um, so thrilled. Awesome. Uh, Nate, it's really cool that you're on board with the Free Jacks. I know a lot of people are really excited about that, including myself. We're going to say one word to exit the video, and it's this one at the top of this uh, particular little uh, sign here. We're going to do that in three, two, one. Huzzah! Yeah.